Uh, well, the person that is coming, uh, she had a problem with the taxi and she is in the uh, in the words of uh, no come <laughs> and now she's uh, walking until the, our building. Then the idea is probably to, to shift and then Marseille will, will make the presentation for the memory of, uh, of Juan and then we would change the order of this uh, first part. Okay, so um, let me start by saying that um, this year, the doctorate program on Química Teórica y Modalització Computacional has joined the Institut de Química Teórica eh, Computacional. Comput eh? No se sent? Oh. So let me start by saying that this year, the, uh, doc the doctorate program on Química Teórica y Computacional de la Universitat de Barcelona has joined the Institut de Química Teórica y Computacional de la UB també um, to, to, to have this, um, this session, this meeting, yeah? because um, there is someone who's Juan Novoa that has been a dear member of the IQTC and also was the first um, coordinator of the doctorate program. So we thought that it was a nice occasion to bring together no? um, Juan as not only a, a scientist and a member of the community, but also as, a, as someone that has been involved in the in, in teaching, no? in the in the uh, yeah, in building doctorates and, and, and students. So we thought that human beings, no, we are um, n-dimensional. No? We we have different dimensionalities. We have different components. Um, and today we wanted to to give you a, a little um, little walk around uh, what Juan was for us. No? So what defines us is our personality. We define what our interests are. No? It, it defines what we do for a living um, and who we care for, right? So that defines us, and that was what Juan um, what defined Juan also, right? So as for personality, he had obviously uh, intellectual capability and, and he was very passionate about what he was doing. And besides that, uh, he had willpower and he was hardworking and he had different skills, yeah? So he had social skills, he was a very commercial guy, he had collaborative skills and he was always looking for networking, yeah? So, no something, Arasi. Um, and on top of that, he had this large curiosity. He was witty, uh, he was stubborn and delocalized. You never knew where he was, but he was there. He was so charming that everything he did was good. And he was a good person. Yeah? So these trends on his personality uh, built something um, as a person and as uh, scientific um, uh, features, yeah, because then what his interest light on, so, so his interests um, were about quantum chemistry and material science, obviously, and molecular magnetism and crystal packing and coding. So these were all, all academia-based interests, yeah. But then there was also this Juan that was interested in football and was interested in skiing and in swimming and mountaineering. And he did like, did enjoy listening music and playing guitar. And we all had to endure this playing guitar thing. And also he enjoyed eating out and drinking out with friends and colleagues. And um, he also enjoyed going to conferences and going to conferences, and going to conferences, and also organizing conferences. Yeah, so um, this is just a, a taste of his interests. Yeah, but it was not just the Juan Novoa who was scientifically based and academia based, but also the Juan Novoa that was enjoying life and that uh, was sharing his life with others. And then what we do for a living. So obviously he was hired by UB 
to, to teach, but we are all teaching in UB because we can do research. And then he started the GEM2 group, this molecular materials structure group. And not just that, but also he was one of the people that um, gave, promoted the EQTC. And um, it was a joint project from the Universitat de Barcelona. It was a joint project that involved different departments, that involved different people, that involved all of us, okay? And apart from that, he promoted the computer service. He promoted also the Scientific Catalan Network. He was involved in the Real Sociedad Española de Química. He was involved in the Quality Agencia, the ANECA. He was also involved in the Erasmus program that was run by him and by Mike Roth. Uh, so he was involved in Universitat de Barcelona and King's College London. He also was involved in the Master of uh, Theoretical Chemistry and Quantum Modeling that is still running. And he was also involved in the doctorate program who I'm now coordinating, and in the ITN. That was also uh, an Erasmus, um, let's say, doctorate program. So he is always been involved as these two uh, facets, right? Is teaching and then also promoting, starting. Then he had other people going after him, right? But he was always there to give this kick, kick off. And then we are defined by who we care for, right? And he cared for his colleagues. Yeah, it was, our department has been always been really uh, social. Yeah, we had these hikings and we have these uh, Christmas parties and we have different little things that spice a little bit our lives. Yeah, so he was involved and he cared for, for his colleagues. Uh, colleagues that were obviously from the department, but also from Spain or international ones. Okay. Also, he cared for his friends. Yeah. He he had different interests, and so he had different friends from different places. Yeah. Not just from academia, but also from other other places. Ah, and here here is one of his most um, trendy red jumper. And who doesn't remember his back, right? So, so this is the Juan Novoa that uh, usually went to these conferences and to these congresses. This is the image of Juan. And then also, uh, uh, we had these group meetings. Yeah, that wasn't not academia anymore. And also for his family, he cared for his family a lot. Yeah, daughters and, and granddaughters. So this is what I wanted to uh, tell you about Juan a little bit. It was it's a brief tour about his n-dimensionality of Professor Juan Novoa, of Juan. And this is Juan, yeah? A unique overlap of good person, and a recognized scientist, and a fair friend, and also a caring family man. A unique combination uh, to define a unique Juan Novoa. Um, and si em permeteu la llicència, if you don't mind me saying, a unique, colorful combination. Yes, indeed. Because maybe you don't know, but Juan, when he was doing his presentations, his talks, he did like a lot to mix colors, which were really colorful. And we were always telling him, Juan, they don't quite match very well. But he didn't mind. He did like to, yeah, to, to stress the different things that he thought were interesting. So for all of that, today we wanted to honor him a little bit in this meeting and to remember him as he was, as he is in our mind. So thank you very much. And for that, we have uh, Mike Rob, who's gonna give this first um, talk. But before he talks, Eliseo will make a presentation of the Institute de Química Computacional, right? And thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Merce, for this introduction to the memory of, of Juan. And also, first of all, I, I want to thank to the Scientific Advisory Board for, for coming. They already visit us several times. Last time was in July of, of last year. Uh, since July last year, well, we, we had good news. We had good news that uh, the Excelencia Maria de Maestro was renewable. Already, uh, obtained the, the renewal of this uh, Excelencia seal for the uh, for the funding agency. And also today we have Cristina Espa coming from the funding agency to to visit us. Uh, basically, well, all of you know know a little bit the, the composition of the, the institute. I will make a, an overview since last year there are not many changes, but there are some, some changes in some areas. Basically, you have here the, the composition of the institute is basically the same one than one year and a half ago. Basically, we can say that there are new members obtaining Ramon Cajal position, some lector position. This is the, the main change that uh, we have in the institute. Some of them already arrived last year. The well, the the list of Ramon Cajal appeared last week. Then it's not clear if we will have new members from this uh, from the call of this year. But basically, we have more or less the same composition. We can mention that we have now more experimentalists, as you will see in the in the presentation today and tomorrow. We have some people not only doing calculations, also making experiments. Um, basically, a uh, level of FICRA professor, the composition is the same. Xavi Barril was already was a member with uh, sharing his participation with the Biomedicine Institute of, of the UB. And basically, the amount of students and master students that we have is relatively similar. Every year, I, I want to remark the, the huge ch change that uh, we have in comparison with the uh, before the first Maria de Maestu, that we have more or less almost three times the amount of PhD students that we have in the year 2018 when we started with the previous program. Well, also concerning computers, the computers are important for our research. This is the, the actual uh, capabilities that we have in, in the Institute that belongs to our Institute that are installed in, in this building. Basically, if you compare with one of the computer centers in Barcelona, the SUC, you can see that we have more resources that they have in this in this SUC. However, of course, if you compare with the big national facilities that it is BSC, we are far. You can see that they, they have almost two orders of magnitude with manganese four. They are installing now uh, next at the beginning of next year, Manga, uh, Mare Nostrum 5 will be available and will be at least one order of magnitude bigger than the manganese 4, then you can see that there is a huge difference. But many groups of the Institute are using these computer facilities, then it's a, we, are, we have in a very good situation for our research, taking into account the computer, the computational resources that, that we have. Concerning the activities of the Institute, uh, one of the ideas for the, for the next uh, semesters is to increase the number of uh, speakers, uh, number of uh, uh, talks and presentations that we have in the Institute. The idea is to create every, almost every Tuesday at, at noon to have a, a conference of the Institute. Then we will have three different cycles. One is more or less to follow with presential talk to invite uh, professors that Jordi Puate, he will be in charge of, of these uh, presentations or to organize these, these presentations. The idea is also to have more information. I think one of the problems that we have now in the Institute is a little bit of lack of communication between the groups. And then I think in order to improve that, the idea is to that the PhD students that they already, they are in the third or the fourth year, to start some presentations of these students. Presentations are around 20, 25 minutes. Then we can see more or less the research that we are doing in, in all the, the groups of the Institute. This is, I think, a, uh, a way to have more information about the research of our colleagues of the Institute. And the, th the third cycle is we have now a commission with uh, some PhD students. Sorry, I think there is an additional one that was added during this weekend. 
And this, uh, these students, the idea is that they will contact to relatively well, to very famous um, people that probably to come to Barcelona, especially people from the States or from, or from Japan, that will be difficult just to, to come here for a, for a talk of, of one hour, try to organize online talks. Of course, we probably will have to change the, the schedule to, to, to do that in the afternoon, not, not at noon, depending on the, of the difference of uh, hours with the, the speakers. But the idea is more or less on Tuesdays to have an activity to, to of this kind of uh, cycles of conference. Concerning the, the innovation, during, during the last uh, year, we have some new, well, we have a novelty. Basically, in the Barcelona Supercomputer Center, they have created a, a Catalan network. This Catalan network, basically, the idea was like the old Catalan networks that we belong. Francesc Quillas was the director of, of this network during many years devoted to computational chemistry. Now, the, this uh, Catalan networks, they focus on basically innovation, collaboration with companies. And then this, this is the, the, the network that was they succeed to have. And uh, eight groups of the University of Barcelona belongs to, to, to this network. And six groups of our institute are in this network. These people, they have funding to help you innovation, to create, uh, to have patents, to create a spin-off, all these uh, Things related with, spin, with uh, innovation, they can uh, help us to, to do all this uh, administration and all these processes. Also, I want to mention that in our institute, in the group of Luisa Maria Bofi, that is in, in the audience, uh, basically we have a, a, a relation, a, a, an agreement with IBM in topics of uh, quantum computing related with a patent, and also, well, they have some very nice results and a collaboration with the with the people of, of IBM. Related also with outreach activities uh, in, the, in the Institute, we have developed uh, an application that I think is, I think I have an animation, is for mobiles and is just to visualize structures three-dimensional using augmented reality in, in mobile phones. It's free, you can download. I think few people in the chemistry department is using this this uh, application, we have a database where you can put the molecules, the students can, can download the, the structures, they can, they can visualize the structures, and I think it's something that we have to promote to use, as well as the virtual reality. Tomorrow we will start after this journey with the new trends of computational chemistry. The last two years were devoted to artificial intelligence and quantum computing. This year is devoted to virtual reality. We already in the Institute, we have nine headsets. And then tomorrow, we will have a couple of presentations of the people of Nanomi, uh, that is a company in San Diego in the States that are developing a, an amazing program to, to have with the virtual reality with the headsets to have a three-dimensional representation of the, of the molecules. Well, also, as the, we will have some outreach activities this year. The, there is a special journey of the institutes, of the, all the institutes of the 18 Institute of the University of Barcelona. That this year the topic is artificial intelligence. Then uh, I will ask some of you that are working in this topic, maybe to prepare a presentation or to prepare an overview of the things that we are doing in the Institute of Artificial Intelligence. Also, the president of the university, he he sent uh, us uh, an email saying that next year is the quantum year, and we are an institute with a research related with quantum things. Then we have to prepare uh, some activities for for the for the new year. To well, then he will be happy with us. <laughs> uh, concerning with his happiness with us. <laughs> I have here the evolution of the funding from the university during the last years. It's the thing that we call CPR. It's in Catalan, it's Contracta, uh, no, Contracta Programa de Recerca. This is the amount that the institute receives every year. Basically, the university put uh, an amount for the 18 institutes. Then they are looking for publications, for projects, and they decide how to to, to distribute the money with uh, the criterion, basically Q1 publications and the amount of money that we receive from the, 
from funding agencies. Basically, you can see here that the evolution of uh, during the last year of the, of the funding that we received from the UV is not very good. You know, we, we have now this year almost uh, half of the amount that we have in 2019. Then the situation is not very good. Uh, well, you can say you compare with other institutes that you know, for instance, here you have the Neurology Institute that is also Maria de Maestu, Cosmos is also Maria de Maestu, and two institutes that are not Maria de Maestu, Nanoscience and the Complex System Institute that are not Maria de Maestu. Well, we can see that we are here, it's the same color, red and red, here. Uh, UVX Institute that it is just sl slightly larger than us, they have almost twice the same amount, the, the money that we have. And if you compare with the other institutes, we are relatively far, okay? The reason, well, we are a small institute. Basically here, the, the university doesn't consider the amount of people that are in the institute, just is the sum of papers and sum of the money of the projects. And this is the parameters that they are using to distribute the, the total amount of money. And then you can see that, well, uh, as probably many of you know, the university also hired a company to analyze all the results of the institutes. We pass this audit and then we will have the, resu the results uh, soon. One of the things that we have when we were talking with the people of this company is that we are very small. Uh, bas basically, if you compare in our case, for instance, these results are not bad if you compare par by person. For instance, the Nano Institute is approximately five times li larger than our institute. Then if you multiply by five, well, we will, we will be here in comparison, but in the reality is that we are very small and we need to pay computer technicians, other things that they don't need to pay. And then this is the economic situation of the institute is a, a little bit much more difficult than other institutes. One of the parameters are the, the journals. Here you have the evolution in the last eight years of the publications. Basically, well, the total number indicated in, in red, you see that there is not a, a big change, more or less we have the same number of publications every year. For the calculation of the university, the, the key parameter are Q1 publications. Well, this year is not very good. However, probably the most important, if, if we look which are the the publications that we have in journals with impact factor larger than 10, you can see that we have a, a good evolution. We start now, we have almost 35 uh, journals published on journals with impact factor than, than 10. Well, it's true that uh, these are a DORA parameter, then we have also to move to other parameters to, to, to validate our research. And well, here basically, we have the, the distribution of the money in the, in the present Maria de Maestu. Uh, this uh, distribution was already discussed with the, with the external committee. Basically, we have some general funding, and then the, the grants are usually for the, for the guarantees and for the director and for the people that play the role of guarantee. And basically, this time, the, the last time we created some grants and were we distribute the money with uh, to, to with a selection of the grants that was done by the, the external committee. This time, as we had many young researchers, we were thinking that the idea was to potentiate the, 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 the funding for, for these people. Then we already assigned a fixed quantity for all the young researchers that they have a relatively uh, good research uh, background. And then also to cover some two projects of transference with the same amount. This is basically, this is basically distribution. And finally, two groups that uh, to cover the, some funding, to, to add some funding to, to, to a small groups. Basically, with all of this, and also to, to keep an amount for some welcome packs of new members, we have distributed the total amount of the, of the Maria de Maestu. This distribution is different than the things that we did uh, previously, but I think in, in this way, we can, we can help with this amount, two of these potential and young researchers, two of them, they can pay more or less a, a grant for three years to have a PhD, to share a, a PhD student. And we think this is a, a good way to distribute the money and also the, the external committee was agree with that. Finally, this is my, my last slide. Basically, well, we are more or less at the beginning, as I mentioned, we have the 
good news that uh, we, we have uh, again the Maria de Maestu was last November. Then when we did the proposal, we have to indicate some indicators to, 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 to verify the, the quality of the research that uh, we will do in, in, in this period. And basically you have here the, the baselines that were the, the, the data that we have in 2021. You have different indicators. Here we have selected some uh, bibli bibliometric indicators that are probably in agreement with all the DORA philosophy and also some, well, some innovation. And basically here, well, the ability to compete in some, in some calls the, and the external funding. Well, this was the, the baseline values of 2021. These are the values that in the proposal we proposed for the, for the end of, of this period in 2025. And these are the values that we have for, 20, for in the, the last year. Basically, of course, there is not a huge change between the, this year because, well, the impact of the, of the new Maria de Maya 2 is, is very small because basically the people is now hiring uh, new people, new PhDs and new postdocs. Then the, the impact of this, I, I hope that we will have in one or two years. And this was basically the, my, my presentation. Then today we will have the, the meeting with the, with the SAP after these presentation sessions, and tomorrow we'll have more presentation sessions of the people of the Institute. And finally, I want to thank all of you for, for coming. And I think we are, yeah, we have a delay of five minutes. It's, it's okay. Then I think Merce, she will share the, the first session with, with Mike. Thanks. So, Mike, please, if you, if you can get like up the come here. The one that says PDF. No, not that one, the other one. The one above it. That one. The PDF, yeah. that's it. PowerPoint doesn't work. Spain. Okay. Or at least the Mac version doesn't. Okay, though. So, um, I was previously Professor Mike Robb. Um, he is now of the Imperial College London, but he previously was working at King's College London, and previously in Queen, Queen Elizabeth Elizabeth's. College. Yeah? And there was one where Juan was uh, did a postdoc with him. And um, well, it's not because of that that we have uh, Mike here, but it is also because of that that he is here. He is brilliant. He is um, well. He he doesn't need presentations actually, and and he has also these social skills that make a great great scientist also a great person. And it is a pleasure to have him here, about controlling the electrons in excited state chemistry. So, your stage. Can you hear me at the back? I don't know whether this microphone is on on or not, but. Okay, so thank you, Mr. And, and it's a pleasure to be here as usual in Barcelona. I've been lost count of the number of times I've been here. When I come up Avenue Diagonal, it's like coming, coming home again. And it's particularly, particularly happy to be here uh, in, in honor of Juan Navoa, who was not only a co-worker, but also a good friend over, for over many years. Um, so let, I was going to start just with one slide about, about Juan. Maybe you can see that. As Marseille mentioned earlier, um, my first really professional interaction with, with Juan was 40 years ago, almost impossible to believe, at Queen Elizabeth College, which is, is not there anymore. It was originally King's College for Ladies, which is where I started my career, which is probably a good place for a, for a, for a young man. Uh, but we've been collaborators ever since with some um, 20 joint papers, uh, including some with, with Marseille. But my favorite will always be uh, the one of the Wolf rearrangement in 1987. We were doing CASA CF calculations with geometry optimizations on potential surfaces uh, for a, a real organic, organic reaction. Uh, and this was before our CASA CF was even included in Gaussian. It was run with a program called the Polyatom, and it was heroic stuff back then. And one of the first trips I, I took to Barcelona 
uh, was one was started his career here in the computer center, running the back. So you had your own computer. It had only one core, not not four thousand. Uh, and the computer center was his office. Uh, and we were carrying on many things that we started with. But one thing he suggested that we might do is have a look at 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 spin densities. Uh, and so while I was here with the two of us, wrote a code uh, to compute spin densities. And there you are, there's a picture, oops. Uh, it's just a matter of catching the right, right button. There's a plot of some spin densities in an adamantane thing, and it used, it used that bit of code. We've since rewritten it, um, but, but it's still the basic stuff that I started in this back room in the, in the VAX. Then I've got all sorts of personal things that you can ask me about afterwards like Watok Zero and Lago de Garda. I can tell you some interesting stories about that. I can tell you about skiing in, 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 the, in, in the Pyrenees and the day my kid broke his leg on, on Christmas Day and how much fun that, that, that was. And then one had a family from Galicia uh, who made something called Arujo. Uh, and I don't remember much about the discussions after that, but maybe if you prompt me a bit. Uh, uh, we can go on. So um, I'm going to structure my talk a little bit differently today because I really want to talk about how the electrons can be controlled and drive chemistry. Uh, it's a challenging topic, so I'm going to try and present it in a slightly different way by showing you some results and then dropping you in a little bit of theory how we actually do, do the calculations and mixing up sort of results and theory because I think if I start off just discussing the theory, you'll all walk uh, out of the room. So the basic idea is actually summarized here. Suppose I create a hole in this adamantane-like system. So this is a, a plot of the spin density. I create a hole here. What happens if I do the best quantum mechanics I can? Well, it's not a stationary state. So you remember your elementary quantum chemistry about stationary states and the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. But if I create a hole, it's not a stationary state. It will evolve. In fact, that's exactly what happens in, in 2.4 femtoseconds. The spin density moves onto the, uh, onto the other ethylene. Yes? So this is electron dynamics. It's not stationary state chemistry because you're used to thinking about the nuclei moving and dragging the electrons with it. I want to take the opposite approach. We're going to move the electrons and have them push, push the nu nuclei, and I'll explain the experiment. It can be done. It can be done. Then. So my orientation is just a little bit different. I want to examine what happens to the electrons if I set them in motion, try and describe how the experiments can be done to do that, and what sort of theory you need to, um, to treat these problems. So just by way of background, about 10 years ago, our physicists came to me and said, we're going to do these, calcula we're going to do these experiments at LINAC in California. Can, can you do some calculations to, to support this? And I didn't really understand what they were talking about, but I said, yes, actually 10 years earlier, we had written this code and we're looking for a useful application for it. And the rest of that story is the subject of this talk. So again, I said, I'm gonna try and present things pictorially and then give you the theory. So I'm gonna imagine that I've got this adamantane-like system. I hit it with a laser. Uh, and if I create the, sit the situations ideally enough, I won't excite one state but I might excite several, and that's the whole idea. And if I can control the ratio between those states when they're excited, I'm controlling the electrons and they'll then drag the, nu the nuclei. And so this is sort of a pictorial representation of the method that we use for doing that. I'm gonna distinguish two states, red and green. Uh, I excite this thing and I end up in either this state or that state. All the nuclei are moving and I'm gonna describe the nuclei quantum mechanically. So each one of these bell curves represents a trajectory, but a quantum trajectory, and the coloring represents the mixture of those particular states. So what I'm actually creating is a great big soup of nuclear motion and electronic motion, and then I have to look at the final result over here, which is trajectories. Each one of those trajectories has a composition or excitation of various states, and the overall result properly averaged is, is what the nuclei are doing after I zap it with, with the laser uh, at the beginning. So how do I follow what's happening to the electrons? Uh, this is the story of my spin density. So this is a plot 
of the spin density on the, either that carbon or that carbon of the adamantane like system as a function of time. And over about 15 femtoseconds, you can see that it's oscillating back and forth between the two ends, that's electron dy dynamics, but you can see the amplitude is not remaining constant. Why isn't the amplitude remaining constant? Because those electrons are pushing nuclei. So eventually, if it goes back and forth enough times, it'll settle on one end or the, or the other, and I will have some real chemical change because the bonds will be in a different position than, than when they started. What actually happens in, in this system is fairly straightforward. You've converted a symmetric stretch to one that's localized on one end or the, or the, or, or the other end. And of course, the reason that thing is decaying these the, I'm plotting the bond lengths so of the two ends. You can see the bond. It, I've got an asymmetric vi vibration in, in the two terminal ethylenes. And of course, the energy is changing. And this is occurring over a period of 10 femtoseconds, so much, much faster than uh, ordinary chemical reactivity. Interestingly, we had done ordinary quantum chemistry calculations some 20 years earlier with Luis Blancafort in, in, in Girona. And this is the potential surface for this same reaction. And I've not mentioned the potential surface. In fact, it's gone out the window. Yes, the potential surface is not there. The calculations that we are doing involve electronic motion. If I take the electronic motion and I can compute the gradient and the Hessian correctly, then I can predict the geometrical change and I don't have the potential surface. I don't need it. So I'll try and develop this idea slowly. So the field is actually beginning to be called atochemistry because the, the scale of the, of the reactivity is taking place on, um, on times of less than 10 femtoseconds. There's a nice review written by Morgan Zahir, if, you, if you're interested. She's a, a former PhD student that finished about, about five years ago. So how does one actually do this sort of thing experimentally and theoretically? I tried to put it all in one simple slide. Uh, theoretically, I have a linear combination of, of states. So I'm mainly cations so far because they're easy to talk about. I, I will create a superposition of those states and look at the chemistry and how the nuclei move on that superposition. Then the experimental side, I can do that in my theory. The only thing that happens is I've got this E term over here, which is the laser pulse. It just goes into the one electron and plutonium. So I can do the calculations both on the dynamics of the electrons in this superposition. And if I want to, I can put the laser field into the Hamiltonian and actually do the, do, do the actual spectroscopy. Okay, so I want to start with a really simple example. This is a radical cation of toluene. This is, oops, yeah. Why did you do, do that? I hit the wrong button. Yes. So the ground state surface is the neutral and the upper one is the, is, is the cation. It's a, a quasi-Yon Teller system. I have a degeneracy here, and I'm starting the calculation just off the conical intersection. And I can map out the space of the geometrical and electronic change by writing various isomers around the, around the corner. So if I ask everybody in the audience what would happen if I started the chemical reaction at this point, well, you would say it would roll down to the moat and rattle around, yes? The question I want to answer is what happens if I start with the superposition of this state and this state and see what happens to the, to, to, to the dynamics and how is it different? But now, now you've got to forget about the potential surface because what happens can't be understood by looking at the potential surface. So the left-hand side is the classical picture uh, I'm plotting up the nuclear motion in blue, and that's what happens if you release the ball at that point on the, on the lower potential surface. It rolls down into the, into the moat. Now what happens if you create a superposition of those two excited states? In other words, I'm going to... Oh, I keep hitting the wrong button. Um, what, happens, what happens if you supervise, superimpose the wave function for this state the wave function for that state, treat it completely as another state, compute all of its gradients and everything correctly, what happens to the nuclei? And so this picture on the right explains what happens to the nuclei. 
This is the same geometry that I started. Now the blue curve is the geometrical change. Notice it, it's at right angles to the previous one, okay? Because when I mix those two states together, then I've got a new term that comes in the gradient, which is the off diagonal gradient, if, if you like, which is known as the derivative coupling. So the nuclear motion starts off completely at right angles. So by simply superimposing those two states, I get a nuclear trajectory that's, that's done, done a right angle turn. There is no electron dynamics in the conventional. This is the picture of the electron dynamics. Now, when I've done that superposition, I in fact localize the electron density, and you can see the, the magenta curve is the electron dynamics in the same space. So the electrons are sloshing back and forth between those two resonance structures. And each time they reach each turning point, just like a normal vibration, where the gradient gets steep. So you not only have this off diagonal gradient that's coming from the, the derivative coupling, but you have the, the electrons moving back and forth and pushing the nuclei. <coughs> so now, now to a real life problem where the experiments have actually been done. Um, the benzene radical cation has five states. Uh, they've done the experiments by exciting all the five states. And they, the weight of each state, this thing isn't working very well. The weight of each state is given by the, uh, by, by, by the cross section. So you can go away and do a cal calculation of exciting all those five states and let the nuclei move. Or you can take the conventional picture which is to say, start at a point like, like that, and the system will decay, pass through a conical intersection, pass through a conical intersection, pass through a conical intersection. So one case, you've got a decay on a potential surface through successive conical intersections versus what might happen if you excite all states simultaneously with various weights. So just a little bit of theory as an aside. Um, this, this is the superposition of those states. So my wave function just has this distribution of these five states, E, B, C, D, et cetera, et cetera. I've created a proper wave function with them. And this has to be contrasted with this sequential decay through, through conical intersections. So what's the difference? Well, here's a picture of the population of a state starting in the Frank Condon region. And I just let the ball roll. It goes through a point where the two states are, 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 are degenerate. Uh, and I emerge with most of the population on one state as opposed to the other one. That's conventional chemistry going, going through a surface crossing. Notice, however, that if you, do the, if you do the quantum mechanics, that in fact, you actually stimulate electron dynamics even passing through a, through a conical intersection. Now, would anybody like to guess what happens if I excite five states simultaneously? Chicken soup, mess? No, not at all. Oops, not at all. These are the populations of these five states as a function of time. You can see they're undergoing quite a complicated electron dy dynamics, but this is the bottom two curves you want, you want to look at because I've chosen this rather carefully. And these are plots of the population or the amplitudes of, of the normal modes. And I don't get a chicken soup. What happens is I populate two normal modes preferentially. So this is a real, this is a design done this deliberately, pick those five states in an equal ratio, I populate two normal modes. And what happens is the vibrational energy is distributed in two, in two, in two stretches. Well, the rest of it is another two hour lecture with lots of details. So maybe that's, maybe that's enough for that problem. Um, this is a theory. It's what Americans call an existence slide. Yeah, so this is many, many years of work, and you don't have to worry about it too much, except that what we do is, just like conventional quantum chemistry, we have a wave function. But instead of diagonalizing the Hamiltonian, we solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and we propagate it in time. Right? So that's the only difference. I'm doing electron dynamics. I'm solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation rather than the stationary state equation. And that's fine, except that now, all the nice things you used to have for evaluating the gradient are no longer zero. So you have to use the full expression for the gradient, which is given at the bottom of the, of the slide. So coding that requires a heroic effort and getting it right. And in fact, as you might imagine, 
of all the time that's taken, almost all of it is spent, is spent computing the gradient. So the approach is slightly different. We're using an electronic wave function that's a solution of the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Forget the potential surface. The problem is evaluating the gradient. And as long as I know what the electrons are doing and I can evaluate the gradient properly, then I can focus on, on the electrons rather than transition states and conical intersections and things like that. Um, we do the nuclei quantum mechanically as well. This is a collaboration with Graham, Graham, Graham Wirth. I don't need to say too much about it, except that we solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation for the nuclei as well. So we're, we're solving the electronic Schrodinger equation, the time dependent one for the electrons, and in concert, we're solving the time dependent Schrodinger equation for the, for the nuclei. And that takes you back to that first picture that you had where you could see those little blobs going around with various colors. That's, that's one way of visualizing the solution. <coughs> okay, so then this is what we're trying to do. By taking a coherent superposition of electronic states, we generate a cross term between each one of those states, which is known as the derivative coupling. And that creates a component of the gradient that isn't present when you're on a single poten potential surface. And then I have the electron dynamics because I've got a solution of the time dependent Schrodinger equation. The electrons are sloshing back and forth. And these real electron dy dynamics. And at the turning point of that electron dynamics, it's nudging the nuclei. So what I have then is electronic control of, of the vibrational dy dynamics. And the experiments get done in California and in DESE in, in Hamburg. Um, and they're still, they're still ongoing, but we have to work away at the theory as well. So I want now to present two examples, looking at the problem from so two completely different points of view, yes? So either I can become like a chemist and say, I want to create a hole right here and see what happens. So how do I do, 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 do that? Or I can recognize that in, in benzene, for example, if I know something about what states I'm superimposing and I know something about the normal modes, then maybe I can look at that and just decide to populate certain normal modes. So I'll give one example of each. Um, this is an example of creating a hole in glycine. And I've got one particularly good PhD student who's capable of doing one slide that summarizes everything. So here it is. Here's glycine. What I do is I create a hole in one bond. Yes. So every chemist in the audience can tell me what happens if you create a hole in a bond. Bang, it stretches, yes? So then I'm gonna selectively stretch that bond if it, if, it, if it were that simple. So how can I create a wave function that creates a hole in that bond? Well, now I'm using the reverse of the argument that I used before. In fact, it turns out if I create a hole, that is a superposition of a diabatic state because a, a single hole state obviously isn't a stationary state solution. So it's a, sum of it's a sum of stationary states. So one way of creating that superposition is by creating a hole and looking, see, looking what comes out of the soup at the, at the other end. So I'll go and tell you about the rest of the results, but my experimentalist colleagues have already put in a huge grant to go to California next year to make the measurements on this thing with them. I just hope they go at the right time of year and they take me, they take me with them, but, then, but they might not. So here's the story. You create a hole. It's a superposition of several states. So now the question of the initial gradient is obvious. If I've created a hole there, those two nuclei I want to pull apart. So the initial gradient will lengthen that bond. But now the electrons are mobile. And so what I see is electron dynamics. I will see that slosh, that, that electron density sloshing between the various bonds. And I will also see ultimately charge transfer where it settles somewhere else. Okay, so <clears throat> the point is you create a localized hole. It's a superposition that you might design, you might, you might uh, devise a laser experiment to do. The summation of those states generates electron dynamics. I'm going, going to come back to that in a minute. And ultimately at the end of the calculation, you may see the charge transfer settle somewhere. So this end of the slide here tries to summarize the nuclear dynamics. That's where I create the hole. I will get um, the nuclear motion and the electron motion sl sloshing about until finally it will settle in some, in some point. So I create a localized hole and I can do chemistry with it 
by ultimately stretching, stretching two bonds. So nobody can look at a table of numbers just sufficient to say that I, I can predict which of the adiabatic states creating that lo like well, local hole will be. And they are in fact states nine and 10. So I could go away and, and do the calculation another way just by mixing states nine and 10, 50, 50, but I couldn't tell that without actually, without actually doing the, cal the calculation. So <coughs> if I create a localized situation that is automatically not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, it's a superposition, so I can always do chemistry because I think about creating things in a localized way. I have to find out what states are, are involved and then go away and do the and go away and do the electron dynamics. And so ultimately what happens, to make a long story short, uh, is that of course I the CN bond is the one that I've localized. So it stretches most, but you saw the charge migration into the CC, so it begins to stretch. As well, and so you you could have predicted all of these things from the outset. But what are you doing? You're creating a superposition, and you're controlling the nuclear motion by virtue of that superposition. And if you had enough, if you want to sit here for another couple of hours, I could show you the remaining part of the results, where in fact I can put the hole anywhere in the molecule or put a combination of them. But I don't think that's of interest to the audience. One thing that is amusing is that. When you've got electron densities, yes, you plot the electron that spin density as a function of time, we well, could actually Fourier transform that. So then what you get is a spectrum of the, of the electron density motions. And you've got all the normal modes of the, of the electron density, and you can work them out and get some new chemical insight that you wouldn't otherwise have. And the, the frequencies of the normal modes correspond to the energy differences in, of the of the adiabatic states. So when you want to analyze the result, you can create a spectrum like this. And the spectrum, uh, the lines in the spectrum all correspond to these valence bond structures. So you, you can identify them unambiguously by grouping the spin densities in pairs, one's positive and the other one is negative and get this fingerprint of the, of the electron dynamics. And this is what it looks like for the, for the CC. I get two lines here. You can see there's a red line and the green line. And these are these alternating plus minus uh, valence bond isomers. Just about me. Um, so we're looking at coherent superpositions of electronic states. The mixing term generates a new component in the gradient, which is what you use to control the electron dynamics. And the electron dynamics is where we really begin to differ from classical quantum chemistry. So now we don't have the nuclei moving on a potential surface dragging the electrons with it. Rather, we start by create, doing what we want to do as chemists with the electrons and let the nuclei follow. Okay, and I think that's where I, I should stop. Thank you. Okay then, so time for questions. Do we have questions in the audience? No? I have some. Over there. <laughs> so when you were talking about this um, uh, cation example in which you had the electron at the nucleus, can I? Yes. I was surprised because I don't know if it's just a way of representing, but why when you introduce the electron and the nuclei as an equal superposition of the ground first, why does it only move on the right-hand side? Oh, I, could have, I could have chosen the phase ah, the other way around. Okay, so yeah, there's I, no... I either chose it to be A plus B or A, or A minus B. Okay. Or I can choose it to be A plus IB, and then you get something even different. Yeah, because, because that's another thing that I didn't have time to go into. But of course, when I'm solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, I have a real and an imaginary part, both for the nuclei and for, and for the electrons. And this phase difference matters. And you can include that phase if you want to in your laser pulse. Um, but <coughs> it just adds enough. And, and of course, 
it does matter whether you mix A and C or A and minus C. You get a different result that's equivalent. So I would, all I would have to do is take that picture and turn it upside down. But physically, we'll give you... Physically, it means the same thing, but the picture I turn upside down. Okay. Uh, if you have a question, you raise your hand, and I will give you the microphone. Otherwise, I'll keep on asking another one question. Somebody over there. So shall we, is anyone? OK, sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I have a question on these, um, well, two questions. One is related to the experiments in DESI. You were saying that there are some experiments. Um, which is the group doing these experiments? Is this Cavalieri? Cavalieri's yeah, that, that, they're one right? group in 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 Desse. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then uh, the other big bit of in instrumentation, uh, the the group that did the experiments on the uh, on on the ethylene radical cathode, the group in Milan of Nisoli, uh, they used HHG. The group in um, in Hamburg uh, are using X-ray free ele free electron lasers, and then there's another big effort going on in California in the United States. But unfortunately, the experiments are really high technology stuff. I've got my name on one experimental paper along with 36 others. I, I think that somehow I can't, still can't understand the paper, but apparently, you, you, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like sort of it's nuclear, it's yeah. sort of like nuclear oh, physics. Yeah. So my second question is, how big can you do the systems? Because you are solving how, how large. So how many how many particles can you put there? Because you are solving this time dependent okay. during your yeah, questions. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 each normal mode is a series of quantum chemistry ca calculations, yes? So how many quantum chemistry calculations can I do at once? Mm -hmm. That's the main limitation. Mm -hmm. And how long is each quantum chemistry calculation? Because I, I have to evaluate right. the gradient. Um, so with modern parallel computing, I can do a lot of I can do a lot of quantum chemistry calculations at the same time. They're totally independent until you bring them together to actually solve the nuclear problem. And ultimately, you end up being limited in a strange way, because if you do enough of these calculations at the same time, you've got to gather them all together at the end to do the, to do the, to do the nuclear. And the simple I.O. problem that's generated doing that tends to swamp you. So you end up with strange bottlenecks. But I don't think these will last these will, will last for too long. So, so the ultimate problem remains the quantum chemistry. Yeah? So, so if you can do the quantum chemistry and be prepared to run an individual calculation, how long you're willing to wait for the result? Well, I'll, I can wait a month, but beyond that, I've probably lost interest. So those benzene calculations, um, they probably took about a month to, to run to, to completion. And the chances of the machine falling apart in any longer than that, or, but th that will change. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, I guess my question is a little bit related. So this must depend on the quality of the wave functions ultimately, the quality of the ground state and the excited state wave functions. So could you say a bit more about how you select an active space? Um, so I try and be, I've chosen my examples very, very carefully. So that is an issue. Yes. So. So because I have to do that complicated gradient expression, if I can't diagonalize the CI Hamiltonian and I have to solve a couple of linear equations to compute the gradients, then uh, I, I can't do these types of, of calculations. I don't think it, that won't last forever, but that, that really is the main li limitation. So it's why, why I've been doing cations and in the species that we've done where we've not used cations, I probably am going to have trouble running with more than six to eight electrons in the in the cast space because then it's the diagonalization that kills you. Not the diagonalization in the wave function propagation, but it's those horrible that horrible expression in the gradient where you've got numerous terms that involve a Hessian for both the orbital rotations and, and the CI derivatives that just if I can diagonalize it's, it, it's easy. If I can't, I have to solve linear equations and it's nasty. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone with questions in the audience? No? So I have another one. Eh? I, I, I have another one, if you don't mind. 
it's because because I was I was a bit following um Macbeth's last last questions, this evaluation of the gradients, no? So surely you encounter problems with with evaluation of the gradient. So so which systems as you said, no, I have chosen very carefully the systems. Yeah. So Okay, so would, would, okay, so which would be your advice uh, to, to follow this line of... Uh... So one of the interesting things, there are lots of interesting problems where the nuclei don't move. Yes? So then I don't have to worry about, about, the, about the gradient. It's only the quantum chemistry cal calculation. And you can see even in the adamantine example, uh, if I can see something interesting in 10 femtoseconds, the, the nuclei have hardly moved. So that's... That's maybe one part of it. And we have done calculations on protonated shift bases um, where uh, we can show that you can stimulate the uh, bond interchange by, by doing mixing. Uh, there's just a paper out in um, the latest issue, chem latest issue but one of chemical JPC LET, where where we mix a singlet and a triplet um, via the spin orbit coupling. So you can in fact get some very, very interesting results if you propagate on a mixture of a singlet and a triplet. And in fact, you can show that the singlet triplet mixing in some instances affects the singlet singlet behavior. So we do the calculations we can do because we're still trying to get get experience and the, the calculations themselves are challenging to run but perhaps the one of the real reasons they're challenging to run is they got numerical in integration in solving the nuclear equations and that's where you end up with the biggest mess because you need numerical integrations that that are stable and you can imagine that if you've got electron dynamics where the gradient is going like that trying to integrate something that's going like that for the nuclear motion is is a bit of a nightmare so, shall we thank Mike for this interesting talk? Thank you. Okay, now we will follow with the <clears throat> presentation of the people of the Institute. I didn't mention in the introduction, basically the, the research of our Institute focus on three main topics. The first topic usually in the classification that we have is catalysis and energy. The second are materials and nano devices and also physical, physical properties. And the third topic is related with biochemistry, biosystems and biological processes. Now the first presentation that uh, we have is, is uh, from Albert Bruch. Uh, he is involved in his research in this first topic related with catalysis and topics related with, with energy. Uh, Albert, uh, he did the PhD in the physical chemistry department under the supervision of uh, Konstantin Neyman that I think is in, well, here in the audience, I have seen before. And uh, after uh, a post postdoctoral stay in Germany for a few years in Germany, last year he obtained a junior Lakaisha group leader position. And after some months in this position, he moved to a Ramon y Cajal position, and it is the, the position that uh, he has uh, now. Today he, he will present, uh, he will make a presentation, uh, his title is addressing the complexity of nanostructured materials under reaction conditions. Please, Albert, the floor is yours. Ah, now it should, no, okay, great. Okay, so now, thanks for the nice and almost accurate uh, introduction. <laughs> and, uh, and thanks also uh, for allowing me to present 
I work in, in front of the Institute. So today I will present some of the work that our, group, that our group does in addressing the complexity of nanostructured materials uh, under reaction conditions. And this of course is related to computational modeling. And here I have added only uh, nanostructured materials, uh, but we mostly work on nanostructured catalysts, although the concepts and uh, approaches that I will present today uh, apply also to materials modeling in general. And I always like to start by looking at, at this multi-scale view of, of, of catalysis, where here on the right, we have a, a typical reactor with a stack catalyst bed to which uh, reactants flow being converted into products. And if one were to zoom in into the structure of these pellets, one would see that it is a quite disordered materials with uh, particles of the active phase of different sizes and shapes that are anchored into a support material. And it is at the surface of these particles where the catalytic action takes place, where we have uh, a complex network of uh, reactants, intermediates, and, and products, where the chemical or the, where the forming and, and breaking of bonds ultimately depends on the combined electronic structure of these uh, adsorbates and the underlying uh, substrate. And from, from this multi-scale view, different levels of complexity emerge. The first and most obvious one is the structural complexity, which refers to this thing that I already mentioned, that we have a quite disordered material, particles with different shapes and sizes. Uh, and each one of these particles has many inequivalent sites. It's not the same having an attribute in a corner position, in an edge position, at an interface uh, with the support, or at one of the surfaces. In turn, this, what we call the environmental complexity is the response of these materials to being exposed to reactants. Sometimes a metal particle will restructure when it comes into contact with uh, reactants, but it can also change its chemical state. So if you have an oxidizing environment, you might have the oxidation to the corresponding metal oxide, just have some uh, oxygen decorated particles or the formation of some thin oxide films. So this is also something that we need to take into account. And the last level of complexity that we are trying to address is the mechanistic complexity, which is this intricate network of reacting events connecting uh, reactants, intermediates, and, and products, which is already very complex when we only consider this one type of active site. So this typical asterisk that we see in many catalysis textbooks. But what we see is that we have many different inequivalent asterisks, and that once you expose these to reaction conditions, they are often transformed into something different. So we see that uh, these different levels of complexity, let's say, uh, make each other even more challenging. And today I will show how we're starting to address these different levels of complexity through computational modeling, mostly based on the density functional theory combined with different algorithms. So we've all, as, as, as modelers or as theoreticians, we all try to construct representative structural models. But the first step when we start a calculation is always providing uh, the coordinates of our system. So a list of X, Y, Z coordinates that we will then use to, to, to calculate uh, whatever property or energy we want. And typically there are two approaches to do this. One is this knowledge space approach, which is what we do when we have a lot of experimental inputs, so if we have a crystal structure, or we know exactly the identity of a molecule, uh, we sometimes use a bit of heuristics, trying different uh, orientations of a particle that we might have. And we also use chemical intuition to know more or less which arrangement should be uh, more or less stable to prepare properly uh, representative models. But sometimes we don't have such experiment input. Sometimes our heuristics or our, our chemical intuition is a bit biased. And in those cases, it is sometimes better to use simulation-based approaches, uh, which basically build these models uh, in an algorithmic way. And this can be done through global accumulation algorithms or molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo simulations. And what we're focusing strongly in our group is in the application and development of various of these methods, uh, mostly now global optimization algorithms and Monte Carlo simulations to build what we think are more representative models of these nanostructured catalysts. So let's see an example. 
So before I just showed a cartoon, but this is actually what a real technical catalyst an industrial catalyst looks like. So this is a, a famous methanol synthesis catalyst that is made of copper and zinc oxide. And this is used to, to synthesize methanol from CO2 or CO and, and, and hydrogen at high pressures of hydrogen. So it is very complex to characterize what happens when you expose these systems to high, these high pressures of, of, of hydrogen. And there's been an active debate. Some people claim that it is just the copper particles that are active. Uh, some people claim that it is actually some alloy brass phase that is formed when you reduce the zinc oxide particles uh, at these high hydrogen pressures. And there are others that claim that it is just the active sites are something formed that this interface, be interface between these reduced zinc oxide particles and, 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 and copper. Um, and actually there has been some indications that it is actually these copper supported zinc oxide particles that are more active for this methanol synthesis. Uh, but it is unknown what the structure of these particles is, what is their stoichiometry, and of course, what is their activity. Uh, and this is what we wanted to address. This was a collaboration with some colleagues from Freiburg. And we tried to construct what we call <laughs> representative uh, models of these supported clusters, uh, asking what the structure should be, what their stoichiometry should be, and what the effect of having different sizes. And what we use for this is a, a, a genetic or an optimization algorithm that is based on an on a evolutionary algorithm, which basically uh, goes as follows. So first you start and you generate a, a population of, 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 uh, of candidates that is randomly generated and you relax every one of these candidates. So here we just considered zinc oxide structures on a copper surface. Then you select two parents for mating. This means taking one half of one structure, one half of another structure, you put them together and then you relax again. And if this is more stable than what you already had in your population, you accept this candidate in your population and you keep something else out. You iterate this process until you run out of uh, computational resources or until you're satisfied with the result. Um, and this is actually what a run looks like. So here on the left, we have every, every structure that is evaluated by this algorithm. Here on, uh, here on the right is just the, the best structure that it has found so far. And here are just the corresponding energies. We see that it, it just, sometimes it finds good candidates, sometimes it finds terrible candidates. And every now and then it finds a new structure that is uh, considered the global minima at that point. And yeah. And we did that for many different stoichiometries and sizes. So I will not go into all the details describing these structures, but we, just to show you that we did a quite thorough work. But by doing this, we can then follow uh, particle growth. So from this zinc three oxygen one structure to something that is larger, we can also follow the oxygen by oxygen oxidation of these particles or the corresponding reduction. And most importantly, we can combine this with Avinitius thermodynamics, which allows us to calculate the free energy of each one of these structures as a function of the chemical potential of the reactive uh, gas that this is in contact with. And this leads to these uh, uh, phase diagrams where we can really identify then which are the most stable states at a region of this phase diagram, so this shaded area that we're interested in, which are in these very reducing conditions corresponding to methanol synthesis operation conditions. So then once we know, and only once we know that we have structures and oxidation states that are uh, stable at the conditions that we're interested in, can we proceed to then evaluate the CO2 hydrogenation mechanism on these systems, which is what we then did uh, when we had the model. So as you have seen, this, or you probably imagine that the running these algorithms uh, consumes a lot of computational resources, which is what limits a more wide, widespread, uh, let's say, uh, use of these, of these approaches. Um, and this is because we have to do a lot of uh, energy evaluations of every candidate that, that, that we're trying to see if, it, if it's stable or not. But now with uh, optimistic machine learning, there is a way to circumvent these expensive first principles uh, calculations. Uh, and this is, I will not go into a lot of detail about this, but it's just 
a way to map the relationship between a structure and the desired property. Typically, this is done by transforming the coordinates into a more tractable representation that is called a descriptor. And then, with a learning model that can be a neural network or a Gaussian process regression, we map the relationship between these descriptors and the desired property, which in our case is the energy. And this typically has, or energy evaluations with this approach has an associated cost that is similar to those of force field, but an, a, an accuracy that is close to the first principle. And this is what another uh, optimization algorithm that you're using relies on. So here, again, this, this is uh, the Golfi method uh, developed also in the group of Bjorkhammer. Uh, and it also starts with a random generation of, of, of structures. But now instead of locally relaxing every one of them, we just do a single point calculation with our desired level of theory. In our case, it's DFT. Then this trace, trains uh, already a, a machine learning model with that. It generates a new candidate and then it does the relaxation for all of its candidates with the machine learning model. It then chooses a new structure to do a, another DFT calculation of, and a single point calculation, and then it retrains the model and it keeps doing this cycle again until you're satisfied with the result or, or, or until you run out of all clock time in, in, in Maranostrum, basically. And so this is the advantage that you'd never have to do a relaxation with DFT, you just do the single point calculations. And of course, at the beginning, when you just train with something like 20 structures, the model is pretty bad at relaxing things, but if, as you add more and more single point calculations with different structures, this is improved, the relaxation is improved, and the candidates that you generate are also better. And this is a cumulative success, a cumulative success plot for, for this algorithm. So these uh, plots are generated by just running the same optimization a uh, hundred times, and then seeing how long it takes to find the global minimum. You can see that for this test example, it takes two orders of magnitude fewer single point calculations to find this uh, surface reconstruction with respect to the evolutionary algorithm that we had used some years ago for this uh, zinc oxide on copper. So with this uh, algorithm, we have revisited uh, uh, a system that, uh, that we explored also during during my thesis with, with, with Constantine and Francesc, which is this uh, uh, platinum clusters reported on cerium oxide, which are relevant for, for different uh, catalytic applications. And again, we just looked at different uh, 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 stoichiometries for this system. And what we find is that, and this was quite surprising, that it is actually uh, quite oxidized states of these particles that are stable under a wide range of conditions. And this means that actually the, the most of the work that was done, not only by us, but by many others, relying only, only on the reduced counterparts of the systems uh, are kind of, or the understanding from those is a bit incomplete. Um, I should say that this was this, this work was done by, by Jan, who's a, a, our PhD student. And not only the structure of this uh, cerium oxide supported system is complex, we also have a complex electronic metal support interactions. And this is what actually Pablo is looking at uh, during his thesis. So actually for these systems, you might have that electrons are transferred from the metal particle to the underlying uh, reducible support. So you, you have something that is like this redox reaction where platinum eight basically transfers some uh, electrons reducing serum four plus to serum three plus. And we can now actually characterize or obtain the relative energies of all these different electronic states that differ in the number and exact positions of this formed uh, uh, three, serum three plus centers. Uh, of course, you see that often, and probably many of you use BASP, but often if you run a BASP calculation, you will just fall into this uh, state here, or maybe onto this state here, or maybe you get the right number of transfer electrons, but you don't get the right positions and you end up here. So, this is very challenging to sample all these states and really obtain which is the most stable one of them. And this has strong implications for reactivity because, uh, yeah, because this, this transfer of electrons affects 
interface positions differently than it affects uh, second layer uh, positions. And we can see that we have tried to then put different absorbents in the interface or a second layer side. And whereas in the second layer, uh, you do not have, uh, or you do not have significant effects from this electron transfer. And the, at the interface, you really have a stabilization of attributes there upon transfer of these electrons. So it really does affect the reactivity of our system. And this is not only for this uh, platinum and serum oxide, but it also happens for larger systems and for other metals such as, as gold. Uh, so again, uh, what we showed now is that our current approach often is to just, or what we call a traditional constant N approach, uh, is to find a, a global minimum for every spectrometry that, that a system we think might have. And then we evaluate the, uh, the, the Gibbs free energy as a, as a function of the chemical potential we need to plot, And then we look at the potential at which we're interested in, which is the stable spectrometry for that. But we want now to also circumvent having to do one calculation for every spectrometry and being able to explore the uh, space of structures and spectrometry simultaneously. So this is what uh, John is actually uh, doing during his thesis, is developing grand canonical goal out optimization approaches where instead of uh, working with a constant spectrometry, you uh, work at a constant chemical potential and then you just directly uh, calculate or evaluate the free energy at a target potential uh, during your optimization run. So, and then you can basically explore because this space of atomic coordinates and spectrometry simultaneously. And we now have a working prototype of, prototype of, of this. Uh, and this is what a, a run looks like. So in blue, we have the evolution of the free energy of these candidates. And in orange, we have the evolution of the spectrometry that it is evaluating during a run. So we can see that uh, as the run proceeds, oh, as the run proceeds, it does find more stable structures and as, as it goes to the right uh, stoichiometry for this toy system, which is a palladium-3 uh, cluster at the gas phase. We're also looking at performance for this, and it's not great yet. Uh, we see that for very reducing conditions where you have fewer oxygen atoms, it is easier to find the minima. For more oxidizing conditions, it is not as easy, so the performance is not that good. We're now seeing how to combine this with uh, machine learning uh, potentials to increase the performance of, of, this, of these algorithms. How, much, how am I doing time-wise? Okay, I'll, I'll continue. So going back, continuing with this uh, performance uh, plot, uh, it is important to make a distinction between when we're working with clusters and when we're working with nanoparticles, because size does, or size of your system, affects performance. If you have more atoms, you have a, a more complex uh, potential energy surface and it is harder to find the minimum. And this is a, a nice example. If you have a, a surface reconstruction of, of some silicon surface where you only have 14 atoms, you can find the minima almost certainly with around 600 structures. But if you go to 36 atoms, this halves. So it, it, and if you would go to 72, you could probably not find it even if you go to 2000, uh, 2000 steps. So what do we do then when we want to optimize the structure or get representative models for this kind of systems, which have of the order of, uh, I don't know, from uh, 200 to 1,000 atoms? There, what we need is to simplify the problem by constraining the search space. And for this type of bimetallic particles, what we then do is we limit ourselves to the optimization of the chemical ordering of bimetallic nanoparticles. So what we do is we just for a given shape of a particle and stoichiometry, we then want to find what is uh, the, the most stable arrangement of the two metals, assuming that, that the structure of your particle or that the atomic positions will remain the same. And although this is simplifying the problem, you still have <laughs> an almost astronomical amount of different possibilities or permutations possible. Uh, so this is still a, a, a relatively challenging problem. Uh, and we have built a, a, a Python library to uh, address this or to, to uh, let's say, uh, to do this kind of, of work uh, where we, this nanoparticle library has different models. If you want to generate databases for training models, this can interact with different ASC 
calculators. It can also derive the descriptors, train models, and then importantly, carry out all the globalization work uh, or all the globalization runs that, that we need with different algorithms. And the type of descriptors that we use for these are very simple. So sometimes it just, uh, this was actually developed by, 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 by Constantine some years ago already. This is just a, a descriptor that consists on counting the number of atoms that you have in different coordination numbers. Uh, and then the, your energy expression is just this, uh, so this, this vector times the parameter vector. So this is just a, a, a six dimensional descriptor, which is very simple to, to train. We're now extending this and now, for example, we're considering also atomic coordination environment. We consider different atomic types, which differ in the, let's say number of, uh, in the in the types of on the in the number of atoms of each element that an atom is is coordinated by, and then we count the occurrences of every atom type, which means that we then have a seventy eight dimensional descriptor, which is still not big for machine learning standard, but it is a bit harder to train. And here we can see some training curves for this system. We can see how this top approach it converges very quickly already with around 20, 20, 20 structures. And uh, this, this ACE method, it can perform better, but it also needs a lot more data to train. And another advantage of using these kind of descriptors is that we can get local environmental energies. And then if we have local environmental energies, it means that we can also identify the optimal permutations to carry out uh, during, an, during an optimization, which means that we can actually have these algorithms with local relaxations in the chemical in the chemical ordering space, which then has allowed us to, to, to derive basically Bayesian hopping algorithms within this, uh, within this chemical ordering problem, which perform better than just a normal Monte Carlo. When we combine it with a, a genetic algorithm, it is also better. The genetic algorithm actually just for this without the relaxation is pretty bad. And yeah, so this is just some examples of the applications of this. So we can uh, optimize uh, the ordering for different particles. We can then take the same parameters and then apply them to optimize the structures uh, of larger particles and at higher temperatures. So this is a pretty versatile and simple to apply uh, approach. We are also now able to optimize the shape of nanoparticles by considering vacancies as a second metal. And by doing that, we can now also uh, basically derive the most stable shapes for, for instance, a platinum 140 particle, and then for every shape, optimize uh, the chemical ordering at every possible spectrometry. And with this, we have been able to identify some uh, interesting and unexpected crossings, which indicate that uh, the shape of your nanoparticle depends on the ratio between uh, uh, platinum and gold, which is something that, that, that was uh, quite surprising as well. Uh, current challenges. So I said, I mentioned that uh, at the beginning of my talk that we're interested in what happens to these systems under reaction conditions. Um, I have only shown uh, metal particles without any reactants. So now Ricardo, who's the, uh, uh, the student in charge of all these the metallics work currently, he already has developed or has implemented uh, an approach to simultaneously optimize the chemical ordering of a particle and the placement of adsorbates. And this is basically a result just with a, a very simple uh, model for the adsorption. The challenge with this is that it is very hard to uh, develop a sufficiently good surrogate energy model that can describe, uh, oh, that can describe the interactions between adsorbates in different positions with different metals and also in between them. You have strong lateral interactions operating in these systems. In addition, sometimes you not only get kind of a, a segregation of the two elements uh, where maybe platinum, which is more reactive than gold would go in contact with an oxygen atom, but you might also have the formation of an oxide phase uh, of, of, of one of the two metals or of the two metals. And this of course uh, means that we need to go beyond our let's say, fixed metal atom approach for the systems because uh, we will never see a transformation into an oxide if we assume uh, a, a constant uh, crystal structure of our particle. And something that we're also working on is in this, uh, how the support affects this ordering, which is very related to the attribute part. 
But all in all, what we need is better surrogate energy models to account for these interactions. And we also need improved uh, optimization algorithms. And with this, I come to a summary of my talk. So I've shown you how we need to basically algorithmically sample structures to obtain something that is representative and how we also need to account for the oxidation states of these systems. Uh, because sometimes you get uh, surprising phase diagrams. Um, but we are forgetting something quite important and it is that catalysts, uh, which have traditionally been thought of as uh, static entities are actually quite dynamic. This is quite well known already for, for you know, some decades. This is actually um, spectroscopic images taken from from Ertel, uh, from Gaia Ertel, and where you could see that uh, a platinum 110 surface under certain conditions exhibits some constant dynamics where you have uh, constant phase changes between two stable structures, uh, surface reconstructions. More recently, similar effects have been shown also for nanoparticles. So this seems to be a quite prevalent uh, aspect of, of, of catalysis, uh, which basically shatters the textbook notion of a static uh, catalyst that only reacts with, uh, that only reacts with um, reactants and stays always the same. So this begs the question, what are the effects of these catalytic dynamics and activities? Also, what is the role of, of the minima versus the role of the metastable states that are visited always? And what are the kinetics of these phase transitions and how can we characterize them? And this is actually what our student uh, Andrea will be working on for the next few years. And with that, I would like to finish. Uh, thank you all for uh, listening and thank you to funding and to the group and, and computational time and to the technicians of the IQTC also. Thank you very much, Albert, for the presentation. We have uh, time for maybe one quick question. Questions? Quick question. Um, when I was looking at your topological indicators, for instance, you, you choose a, a very, I would say, detailed definition of your topological indicator. But what tells you that this is I mean, it's a so it's it's a way of defining it, but in principle, you could think of other ways of defining that, and you would get into another solution, or or you think that this function includes all possibilities, and you will get um, the, one of the best solutions. I, I just don't know exactly what uh, is let's say what is the motivation to choose this function and uh, or how you choose it. Uh, but when you mean a function, what are you referring no, to? No, I mean your indicator. So you add- Oh, with this descriptor. Ah, this okay, descriptor. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So there's some conditions that a good descriptor has to meet. So basically it has to be unique, yeah. meaning that no two structures have the same descriptor. Yeah. And then it has to be also basically uh, rotation invariant. So if you rotate a structure, it should also remain the same, translation invariant, which X, Y, Z coordinates are not. And- So you are, you are going very in the basic constraints and yeah 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 so first you need to ensure this and then okay. this descriptor I mean, the descriptor that this goffy uh, algorithm uses is just based on on two body terms so it basically just for every atom it, it looks at the neighbor list and then it it, it creates a, 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 a something similar to a radial distribution function but that has these invariance properties. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Any other quick question? No? Who want, who want to ask? Ah, Santiago or Marcel? Maybe two short, very short questions. N nice work. Uh, in your first example, the zinc oxide on, on copper particles, uh, First, do the structures tend to reach the sodium chloride structure typical of zinc oxide that, uh, when you get reach a higher high enough so, cluster? So we always have clusters that are, so the, the one structural motif that we see in all structure is the zinc three oxygen one motif. And this is also found in boritzite. But the sizes of the structures that we have still do not look like Buddhist side, but the local motives, yes. 
And the, the other question is, uh, uh, when you, with your method, do you verify at each point or at the end point uh, whether you have a, a stationary state? Because this otherwise... we, so this we, we do not because I mean, if you have to no, do I, a frequency calculation, <laughs> but what we can do is later, in some cases we have done a frequency calculation mm -hmm. with some of the minima that we find to incorporate, let's say, entropic effects to the phase diagrams. Actually, this is something that Andrea did recently. I think I have it somewhere here. Oh, ah, yeah. So these are, these are not some iridium oxide particles optimized with Goffy. And you can see what the phase diagram looks like with just DFT energies. And then this is uh, this DFT energies plus the zero point energy correction. And this is with then uh, uh, also with the vibration. So there is some differences, but ballpark is. Uh, yeah, because then you are reaching only a thermodynamically stable of favored uh, clusters. Yeah, so and, we do this only on the minima that we have. State yeah, we do this only on the stable state because we can, I mean, we could do it on, on like, let's say the, the 0.5 EB. So the ones that are within 0.5 EB uh, of the most stable that we find, but it's quite costly also. Thank you. Thanks again, Albert. And we will move to the next presentation. Next presentation is Jauma Jaurado. She's a first year PhD student. She's doing the PhD under the supervision of uh, Josep Puigmartí from the physical chemistry section and Rog Mateu that is in the inorganic chemistry section. Basically, she, she will show you a experimental work. If you remember that we have three different topics, uh, his, her research is related with the second topic, with materials, and then she will present new approaches using microfluidics to have uh, new materials. The, the title of his, her presentation, let me check. The title is Taylor Design of a Water-Based Nanoreactor Technology for Producing Processable Soup for Nano 40 nanometers 3D cov nanoparticles and nanospheric conditions. I hope that the title will be very long and the presentation not so long <laughs> because we are. Yeah, I'll try to be quick. Okay? Yeah, I think so. Please, Gemma. Vale. Um, okay. uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Gemma Yorado, and today I'm going to present you. Um, sorry. And I will present you today uh, my research work um, in, during this last uh, year. So, as you may know, in nature, um, there are um, some structures that happen or occur in confined space, as it is the example of the seashell. Um, nature can control the assembly and growth of these crystalline structures, and they uh, perform these targeted functions with just few building blocks. Um, as you can see here, um, the seashell just um, is made of uh, calcium carbonate and just a small amount of proteins and sugars. So um, besides this generation of structures often occur in these under mild conditions. Um, we as chemists, when we try to synthesize materials, um, we often perform these uh, new structures in bulk, not in confined space. Um, we also uh, try to optimize the reaction conditions so that we obtain more crystalline structures and we change time, temperature, the catalyst or the concentration and other factors um, that are involved. And we generate uh, usually these structures under harsher conditions um, than in nature. So um, specifically, I want to focus on covalent organic frameworks, that these are uh, kind of materials uh, very known uh, nowadays. Uh, these coves are mainly either two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Um, they are uh, well known because they are crystalline and porous, and these can serve um, in many, many applications. Um, they are built uh, through uh, uh, between covalent bonds and they are built uh, 
between different building blocks. So here is a little illustration where I show you more or less how it happens. However, when you try to perform these uh, reactions uh, with an irreversible one, it often can lead to unprocessable powders or kinetically trapped structures that is not ideal or what we want to have. So that's why usually you employ reversible reaction mechanisms such as an imine bond formation or other ones, and you try to use modulators so that in the end you have this additional error correction mechanism, and this allows you to have these crystalline tough structures. Usually common um, synthetic approaches are subothermal reactions. Um, however, they are uh, employed using hazardous solvents sometimes high temperatures or pressure, and uh, they rely on the use of modulators. So uh, we came up with this idea of using the COF 300, which is a very well-known COF, a 3D COF, as the model. Um, and we try to synthesize through a confined colloidal approach. So more or less trying to um, uh, see what nature does and more or less try to do this uh, in bulk. So by that, we used a micellar system as uh, nanocompartments or nanoreactors for this confined synthesis. We used two different surfactants uh, that allowed us to build these micelles where the monomers of the reaction uh, were solubilized in water. Um, and then we could perform the reaction in these room temperature conditions and in the end having a colloidal cough uh, solution. So just to... Um, explain you more or less this uh, synthesis. Um, we use this uh, sodium methyl sulfate as the anionic surfactant for our system. Also the CTAP, um, the cationic surfactant, and when mixing them in a specific ratio, we obtain this micelle that allowed us to solubilize both monomers of the COF-300, the PDA and the TAM. So this undergoes a sheet phase reaction and finally an imine bond is formed and uh, water is also formed as a subproduct. So when we try to synthesize uh, this with um, this catalyst, the acetic acid um, at this concentration, we could observe this uh, nice uh, yellow colloidal solution that was usually meaning that we had this imine bond and to uh, get rid of the micelles or to break them, we added this diethanol so that we could um, obtain this nice powder. Um, we characterized all of this and we tried to see what happened if we increase the catalyst since in bulk when you do this, when you do these experiments in bulk with a, having a confined space, usually you get to a certain product. We wanted to see what would happen and we observed that when trying to do this in the um, experiment, after just four hours we observed uh, like higher scattering. Um, However, we flocculated the powder and we wanted to see what was um, in the SEM. So we obtained different morphologies just by changing the concentration of the catalyst. So I will go more in detail with this, but when we tried to characterize this um, through the synchrotron XRD, we observed that in both cases we um, obtained crystalline uh, peaks. Uh, in the case of the nanoparticles, it's true that they matched with reported uh, COF-300 uh, patterns. However, in the case of the nanorods, it was not e matching a reported one, but when flipping the um, observed data, uh, we obtained in both cases uh, uh, similar uh, unit cell parameters of the COF-300. So then um, we studied again the morphology now in this case with the TEM and in the case of the nanoparticles we observed that we had diameters of below 40 nanometers and in the case of the nanorods we had um, ranges like we have this range uh, between the widths of 35 to 65 nanometers and lengths of up uh, more than a micron. So um, later we also tried to study if we had this imine bond uh, by the solid state uh, NMR in this case, we observed here in the nanoparticles and nanorods that we successfully obtained the imine bond formation, as well as in the case of the IR, we could observe this CN stretching bond. And finally, as I was saying, in the case of COFs, it's very important that they are porous. So we tried to see and perform some gas absorption um, experiments uh, to see which was the surface area of both of them. 
in the case of the nanoparticles, we observe a uh, really uh, mesophore structure with these uh, almost 700 uh, surf uh, um, bed surface area, which is very good. Uh, however, in the nanorods, it was not the case. Um, so just by changing the catalyst uh, concentration, uh, we observed that it has a great impact on the morphology, but as well as the physical chemical properties of um, the, both structures. So then, as I was saying, um, by um, it's, it's true that in some cases uh, people use modulators. So we also wanted to see what would happen if we introduced a modulator. In this case, we took the aniline as uh, the modulator, which is a very known um, a modulator in, for top 300 synthesis. However, we had to increase the acetic acid concentration because um, we had to dissolve the aniline first. So we observed that um, the, so the colloidal solution was stable for more than 10 days. So it, that was similar to the top 300 nanoparticles. And when flocculating them and seeing them uh, under SEM, we observed that we obtained this uh, nanoparticle morphology. So it's true that this is just a powder XRD of the nanoparticles without the modulator. We were expecting if we saw an increase in crystallinity or in porosity by introducing this modulator. However, it's true that we obtained this crystallinity again in the case of the nanoparticles uh, with aniline, with this modulator. But um, for the bed, we obtained a less uh, surface area. So um, in our approach, uh, we conclude that it's not, there's no need of using this modulator uh, since our um, properties are not greatly improved. Um, then to simplify things, we wanted to study the growth mechanism of these particles uh, without the aniline. And in this case, we employed the small angle X-ray scattering. Um, for that, we took two different um, time points at 10 hours and at 42, uh, the reaction took place in two days. So we observed that at 10 hours, uh, like between these two measurements, we observed this increase in intensity and the change in slope at uh, low Q values. That means at low small angle. So um, these, resulted in the increase in diameter or the core of the COF 300 particles from almost 30 nanometers to 40. So this was fitted to a three layer spherical model, which um, it was mainly the core of the COF 300 um, surrounded by the uh, hydrophobic chain and the hydrophilic polar head of the surfactants. And it was interestingly to see that the growth was isotropic. So um, at least it's important to know how these um, structures grow. Um, so watching the tendency more or less of different uh, time points, we observed that uh, we have this trend that if we compare through another technique, the dynamic light scattering, we observe that it's similar at 40, that the final size in the end is 40 nanometers. So this is very important since for 3D cups, uh, we observed that having these uh, nanoscale sizes um, results in better processability. So just to show you um, a possible application, um, I show you here an application in micro robotics uh, where we try to form this so-called cough pot. So in the case of, well, the term cough pot just um, describes a micro robot where the, um, it's coated uh, with a cough and the synthesis more or less of this cough pot is mainly that you have a bio template that is spirulina platensis. Uh, you can um, coat it first with iron oxide nanoparticles so it gets these magnetic properties. And finally, you coat it with the uh, COF 300, either the nanoparticles or the nanorods. So, as you can see, this was successfully done. And finally, um, to see uh, the, the, the idea of having this cough bot is that you can co have a control on that. So when you, as, as it was, um, as it had these magnetic properties when applying an external magnetic rotating field, uh, what you could uh, do is basically um, induce this corkscrew motion through this helical uh, shaped uh, um, template. And then you could uh, 
translate this to a net displacement. So I'll show you for a video where you can see how you could control this movement. So this is very interesting. Um, for example, uh, in as applications in micro robotics, but as well as uh, drug delivery systems or biomedicine, etc. So I don't know if you see it, but this is the the micro robot. So so ideally, it should write this cough um, word and. So it should write this. So um, just to conclude, um, uh, we were we could successfully synthesize the three D cuff in an aqueous medium. Um, we could perform this reaction under mild conditions. We had control over the synthesis and the growth of the cuff three hundred nanoparticles. Uh, we could obtain or improve the processability of these uh, materials. And we showed an application in micro robotics or in like future biomedical fields. So before finishing, I would like to thank the group, the ChemInflow group, um, and also all the other people that contributed to this work. And um, that was it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gemma. Have uh, time. One question. Yes, a, a quick question. Why is your um, absorption and desorption that different? Um, so probably we, so we think that probably when using low concentration of acid catalyst, I think it's just here, um, we have this mesopore structure. However, when we probably when we add too much of the acid, acetic acid, the we obtain a faster or a kinetically uh, faster structure. Maybe um, this affects the, the morphology. Also, can affect on the physical chemical properties, and we think that it's. We also think this, that we have some gas molecules trapped inside and therefore they cannot, yeah. Very clear uh, and excellent presentation, Gemma, thanks. Okay. Um, a bit related to that, so I see here in the IR uh, a peak next to the yeah. that one, which might be either unreacted Starting material or acetic acid? Do you know? Yeah, what we it's think that to? it could be some aldehyde groups that get trapped inside this. Uh, since the structure grows faster in the case of the nanorods, we think that probably some unreacted aldehyde groups can be inside this um, structure and therefore maybe also this affects to the um, bed properties exactly. and yeah. things. Any further question? If not, thanks, Gemma, again. Now we have uh, coffee break. We have the co coffee break, I, I guess, just over there. And then you have also, you will see also some posters. Uh, for some security problems, we have reduced the number of posters, but you will have also an email by internet with a link where you can go directly and to all the PDF files of all the posters that we have uh, in these presentations. Okay, we can move to the to the last presentation of this session. The next speaker is Bar Limburg. Bar, uh, he well, he started recently in 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 our institute. He well, I will introduce you him a little bit because uh, he's a new member of the of the institute. He, he did a PhD in, in Leiden, in the group of uh, Jan Ridai, but was working with other people of the group of Jan Ridai. After the, the PhD in Leiden, he moved to, to Oxford to work with uh, in the group of Anderson, working on porphyrins. And well, after that, he, he got a, 
lecture position in the organic chemistry section of, of this university where he's working now. Presently also, he obtained a starting ERC grant. And basically today, I think he will present a part of his scientific career, also results that he, he had from, from Oxford. Please, Bart. Thank you very much, Eliseo. Can you hear me in the back? Is everything working? Good, okay, thank you. So uh, yeah, like Eliseo said, um, I've not been in this industry for too long. I uh, joined probably uh, a year ago. And um, I'll give this uh, presentation as an opportunity to, to present myself and a bit of my previous research, which I've done. So about two topics basically, which fit well within the uh, research areas of the Institute. Uh, so some nanomaterials in particular, single molecule electronics. And later on, I'll talk a bit about metallophotoresis catalysis, which fits well in the catal uh, catalysis way. So why these two topics? Uh, they seemingly seem unrelated, but mostly in my career, I've been interested in electron transfer reactions. And both of these reactions, um, both of these topics are about electron transfer reactions. So first I'll talk about a bit about the fundamentals of electron transfer through single molecules, and then how we currently use uh, electron transfer reactions to make organic molecules. So first off, uh, single molecule electronics. Um, when we are talking about single molecule electronics, we do mean single molecule electronics. So we're looking at how electrons flow through a single molecule in uh, a junction between two electrodes. So for example, um, this is the kind of uh, device that we're working with. What we make is a, a narrow graphene junction here, which uh, acts as the electrode. And we then put a molecule on top that bridges these electrodes. And then we can study how the electrons flow through the single molecule by applying a voltage cluster. So in, in real life, this looks a bit like this. We just uh, have a, a little chip on which we have uh, 850 roughly devices. And we can test all of them by uh, addressing them with these two needles. So how do we make our devices? Um, basically, we we'll start off with just a silicon chip, which has uh, some, uh, some isolating material on top, the silicon oxide. And we start with graphene, which we have made on copper. And we spin coated some PMMA on top. We can then oxidatively remove the copper to get just graphene, and we can deposit it on top of our chip. Then we use lithography, in particular uh, electron beam lithography, to make this narrow graphene junction, and we can burn away the remaining graphene by using ox oxygen plasma. So we're left then with this graphene junction, but this is still a graphene that is connected together, and we need to make a nanosite junction in this. So we cannot do this by lithography method because lithography doesn't go to that size. We cannot make a gap of one nanometer reproducibly. So what we did is we used uh, the process called electro burning. And electro burning is actually nothing more than just passing a big current through the graphene and hoping that it burns to a nice nanometer size junction. So this hoping we can make this a bit more reproducible by doing this in a controlled way. So not just applying a large current and hoping for the best, because that will give you way too big junctions. But instead, what we do is we ramp up the voltage until we see at a point that the current goes down instead of up. And this means that we're burning away some of the, uh, some of the graphene. And if we then quickly ramp down back to zero volt and we repeat the process, we can see that this point becomes earlier and earlier and earlier, up to when in the end we're left with a junction that has this characteristic shape where the current versus the voltage uh, follows an exponential path. And this is indicative of tunneling. And by doing a, a fit to a Simmons model, which is the model used to, uh, to describe this current, we can see that we're left with uh, junctions uh, that have a size of a roughly 1.8 nanometers. So this junction is perfect to deposit the molecule. And uh, we did so, of course, we took our zinc porphyrin molecules and we deposited this on top of this junction. So we should note that um, in this, um, this junction, the, um, the tunneling part is a very specific part. So even though we're just drop casting a layer of molecules on top, the chances that any of these molecules are contributing to the current is basically zero because of the exponential, unless it is right in the area where the tunneling happens. So, this sounds nice, but in, uh, practi uh, in practice, it's uh, a bit more difficult than you, so what you might imagine that it's quite difficult. So we, we tested over 50,000 junctions. I lost count at some point. 
um, of which we really tested around a thousand of them, and only 26 of them were molecular devices. So we have a long way to go if we want to compete with uh, traditional electronics uh, based on silicon, because to make this process viable, we need a success rate of 99.99999%. We're currently a bit below that. So two years of research uh, looks like this, basically. You can summarize it in a, in a little box with all the chips that set it. So one of the problems that we had in interfacing these molecules with the graphene is that we needed to develop uh, a method to, to do this interface correctly. Because as you can imagine, um, if you have two graphene electrodes, it might be very difficult to bind a molecule across its covalency. So instead, what we opted to do was use um, sort of nanographene flakes or just large pi systems such as pyrene, uh, tetrabentofluorine, or hexabentochlorine, and see how the how this structure uh, relates to how many devices we get. And uh, it turns out that actually, in addition to these large pi systems, we also needed long alkyl chain chains, because these alkyl chains are sort of the glue that holds the molecule really to the surface. As you can see here with the uh, calculated binding energies, that if we just have the pi systems, it binds, but it doesn't bind that strongly. Whereas if we add these alkyl chains, you can really see the binding energy go up by a lot. And this is also reflected in the number of devices we get. So you can see uh, the junction formation probability. So that's the probability that if we have an empty junction, and we deposit the molecule, that we get a molecular device, actually goes up quite a lot if you use one of these as anchor groups on the corporate molecule. So then if we have our devices, what do we do with them? Well, we first characterize them to see if we actually have a molecular device. And this we do by, by measuring so-called stability diagrams. So stability diagrams are nothing more than just a current map where we measure the current versus two voltages. So one voltage is basically the voltage across the molecule, the two graphene electrodes. And the third voltage is the gate voltage, which is just the silicon electrode, which is under, uh, under the, the junction. And by applying a voltage there, we can basically shift the molecular levels. And what does this do? Basically, by, um, by measuring uh, these devices, what we see is that if there's um, no molecular level that is uh, in the range of the uh, electrodes, that we don't see much current. We basically just see tunneling through the molecule. And that is what we call a Coulomb diamond. So within this diamond shape here, the current is basically by approximation, zero. However, if we now carefully tune the voltages so that we can see uh, that one of the levels of the molecule enter into this window that is created by the voltage on the source drain, so that would be on these lines here, we see that the current suddenly goes up by a few orders of magnitude. And that is because now the electron doesn't have to tunnel from one electrode to the other, but instead it can tunnel to the molecule stay there for a while and then tunnel off the molecule. So this is basically just sequential reduction and oxidation of the molecule. And indeed, this is what we see. So if we don't have any molecule there, we don't see any structure or well, we see a bit of structure, but it's not because of a molecule. It looks empty. And then once we up, um, deposit the molecule, you clearly see this Coulomb diamond shape. So what can we do with this? Um, apart from uh, making very inefficient computers because we're not getting the devices at a high rate. We could also use it as a spectroscopic tool because molecules have the uh, effect that if you change their, um, their oxidation state, they actually change geometry. This is also, of course, uh, common for, for absorbing photons and going to an excited state. So we see sort of similar effects here that, that you see with if you have uh, an absorption spectrum and an emission spectrum of a molecule, they're usually mirrored. And we have the same effect here. Basically, if we want to transfer a uh, an electron through a molecule, we need to reduce it. And this comes with a change in the molecular geometry. And then once the electron wants to go off, the geomet geometry needs to change back. And basically, this manifests itself in, in this kind of frank Condon principle. And we see this in the, um, in the stability diagrams by these lines that are running parallel to the edge. And in principle, this you could use as a sort of spectroscopy technique because here you can see that um, we are basically seeing the harmonics of the low vibrational modes of the molecule up to uh, 400 uh, or sorry, 40 uh, reciprocal centimeters. So we're measuring 
basically the infrared, like far, far infrared frequency supermolecules. Another thing that we can, can see is that um, um, we can basically develop a, a kind of model which uh, describes the current through, uh, through the molecule based on this kind of uh, um, energy dependent rate constant. So I already showed them here a bit. So here they have the harmonics, but we can just model them as well by getting them this shape. And it turns out we can model each current voltage trace like this by two models. And this tells us um, something about the molecule, but it doesn't tell us which kind of transition we're looking at. However, if we now look at the full stability diagram, we see that uh, actually we have a mirrored case here. And that allows us to then say, OK, if we have this, uh, this resonance here, what does that tell us about the molecule? And what's the charge state of the molecule? So actually, what turned out to be the case is that for most of the porphyrin junctions that we made, the molecule was actually absorbed into the junction in a one plus state. So it was oxidized upon uh, absorbing in this, uh, in this junction, which was very weird for us because we thought, okay, we have a neutral graphene, we have neutral porphyrin, and we drop cast it, it should be neutral. But instead, it was oxidized to a one plus state in most of the cases. So now I'll shift gears a little bit and go away from material science and go more into organic chemistry, because I, I am in the uh, section of organic chemistry after all, um, and talk a bit about metallophotoredox catalysis. But to understand metallophotoredox catalysis, we first have to understand photoredox catalysis. And photoredox catalysis is based on a simple principle of, uh, of photochemistry, which is that a molecule in the excited state is both a better reducing agent and a better oxidizer. So we can see this schematically like this, like we have a molecule which has a homo and a lumo, we absorb a, a photon and this electron is transferred over there. Now this electron has more energy and it's more able to reduce molecules such as electron acceptors which have a lumo around there. But at the same time, we're left with a hole here. And now electron donors that previously could not react with this photocatalyst or uh, excited molecule can now donate an electron back. And this is basically the principle of photoredox catalysis, where we both we do both of those reactions. So, for example, we can start off by having this excited state molecule reacting with an electron acceptor to give a, a negatively charged molecule here and a positively charged uh, photocatalyst, which now still has the hole that we talked about. So now it can react with an electron donor and give a, a, a positively charged electron donor. So there's basically two options to go through. The other process gives exactly the same product, but starts off with a different process. So one is called oxidative quenching, and the other is called reductive quenching. And these initial photo products that we make, we can then use in order to do more chemistry, for instance, to do organic synthesis, which I will get into. So synthetic photoredox catalysis has been around for quite a long time. Um, initially, this was the workhorse of the of the, of the field, but recently there's been a, quite a lot of development in new catalysts for, for a, a wide variety of reactions, starting with these iridium catalysts, which have a wide range of redox potentials that can be tuned by choosing uh, the correct R groups, for instance, here. And recently we're also mostly going to more, it's more cheaper organic molecules that can do these transformations. But where I think really lies the power of photoredox catalysis is when we combine photoredox catalysis with other types of catalysis, such as photoredox plus organic catalysis, which led to the science paper of, uh, of Macmillan recently, or sort of recently, and, um, and the idea of uh, using transition metal catalysis together with photoredox catalysis, which we now call metallophotoredox catalysis. So this is uh, what I'm uh, quite interested in lately to do interesting organic transformations by using metallophotoredox catalysis. So recently we've published uh, three uh, interesting reactions to give these kind of molecules that all have a quaternary carbon center. So this is indicated by the black dots. And these molecules are traditionally very difficult to synthesize by us, even though natural products usually contain a lot of these quaternary carbons. So I thought maybe we can use metallophotoredox catalysis for this purpose, and it turns out to work quite nicely with one big drawback, which is 
that the quantum yields of these reactions, not the chemical yields, the chemical yields are good. You can get a product up to 90% pure, 90% uh, yield, but the quantum yields are very low. But the quantum yields, uh, that means the number of products that we make, the number of moles of products versus the number of moles or Einstein of photons that we absorb in the reaction. And this is, you might think not that important because you can just increase the light intensity, right? But we run into slight problems if we want to apply this at large scale of the molecules, because in photocatalysis, the um, number of moles that we convert scales linearly with the moles of photons absorbed. So that means that if we want to do this reaction and we want to make one gram of this compound using this photoreactor, we need to wait one month. So that's of course not acceptable and we need to increase the quantum yield of these reactions somehow. So last year I was interested in seeing how we could actually, um, if we could find out why these quantum yields are so low. And first off, I started uh, to look into the mechanism of, of this reaction here, which is uh, metallophotoredox catalysis with cobalt. So for this reaction, we use this cobalt catalyst. And basically the reaction works by um, starting off with a cobalt two catalyst, which needs to first be reduced. So this is coming again from the photoredox catalysis part where we're doing a reduction by the photoredox catalysis. So we get a cobalt one compound and this can react with uh, the, our substrate, this allylic precursor. We get this molecule, which loses CO2 and gives us an allyl group. So up to this point, we could see by uh, experimental spectroscopy what was going on, but from that point on, we needed to go to EFT in order to study the rest of the process. So basically, we need another reduction to go to the cobalt two which can then lead to isomerizations in uh, the double bond here, which is actually um, the point of where the diastereoselectivity of this reaction comes from. So I did not explain this yet, but basically if you look at the molecule, this OH group here can send to the front or to the back. And for making uh, organic molecules, as you might very well know, it's very important that your drug has the correct ser stereoselectivity because differences in stereoselectivity can lead to completely different properties. So it turns out that the diastereoselectivity selectivity of this reaction uh, comes from this uh, transition state in between here, which is called a Zimmermann-Drexler transition state. So basically this transition state can have four, um, four different uh, shapes where either the phenyl group here is pointing upwards pseudo-actually or it's pointing equatorially pseudo-equatorially. But we quickly discounted this one and this one because there's uh, a large uh, steric hindrance between the ligand and the phenyl group. So we're left with these two, and for these, um, we needed to use DFT in order to see which one was more favorable. And it turns out that this one, the syn uh, transition state is more favored, which leads to the more syn product. So we also saw this experimentally uh, that uh, there was um, an, uh, a Hammond uh, relationship between uh, the electron negativity of the aldehyde and the, um, the diastereoselective uh, uh, ratio of the product. And we saw that this could be explained because there is actually in the transition state a hydrogen bond present, which can explain that fact. So because I'm talking to an IQPC uh, audience, I also needed to include, of course, this nice uh, DFT picture, um, which shows uh, shows the entire overview of the last step of the reaction where we start off with the cobalt two allyl complex. So we can see that indeed uh, this uh, complex can perform isomerization in this step from one to the other. And we then have the uh, Zimmerman, -Trexler, uh, Zimmerman Trexler transition state here. And the last step is the proto uh, methylation where we need to remove a proton from uh, the product Sorry, we need to add a proton to the product in order to release it from the metal. And this actually turns out to be higher in energy for one of the uh, ones than the other. And uh, we did some microkinetics on this uh, model and it shows that uh, the predicted diastereo selective ratio is completely in agreement with the, uh, with the experiment. However, this still does not explain to us why there's such a low, um, quantum yield because this all seems to be perfectly feasible at room temperature and it is. 
So we needed to go to the photocatalytic cycle. So as I talked about before, we have this cycle where first we have an electron donor in this case. So this is a re reductive quenching pathway where the electron donor is giving an electron to the photocatalyst and this can then give this electron to the cobalt complex. So for each photocatalytic cycle, we can actually release two electrons and two photons as shown by this pathway. So we thought, is this process maybe not so efficient? So let's investigate that. And we did that by using uh, transient absorption spectroscopy. And it actually turns out that this step, this first step, as is always drawn in the literature as just being an elementary step, that is not so simple. Because actually what happens is you excite the molecule, you do an electron transfer uh, from this molecule to the photocatalyst, and what you're left with is this sort of complex. And this complex actually does not separate in solution because we're working in PHF and we're generating charges. So these molecules stay closely together in a solvent cage. And actually we saw that we form it and then it's just, just charge recombination. So it goes back to the initial state without doing any overall electron transfer. So that is a problem because actually it turns out that we need to add a base to the reaction in, in order to make this process irreversible. And uh, if we add a base, then we do see permanent electron transfer. And this is because, if we go back, this step needs to be faster than the recombination step. However, we also noted that if we are adding a cobalt complex to our reaction, we see that there's an additional reaction that can occur, which is an elect uh, not an electron transfer, but an energy transfer reaction. Because this, these molecules stay so close together, they're basically, um, they can behave as an excited state, sort of. And they can transfer their energy to the cobalt complex, which has low flying excited states. And what happens then as, a, as an effect is that if we add more of the cobalt catalyst to the reaction, we actually see a decrease in the quantum yield of the reaction. So this is very weird because you would ex always expect as an organic chemist, okay, I want the reaction to go better or faster. I'll add more catalyst. But actually it shows uh, here that it's um, not good for the reaction. And it's because we need the base to do this reaction. And if this reaction is happening instead, then we're just going back to the beginning without making any products. And this actually turned out to be a case for quite a high number of complexes that we tested. So this turns out to be quite a general problem in metallophotoresist catalysis that needs to be overcome even uh, not just for cobalt, but also nickel complexes, which are basically the workhorse of, uh, of metallophotoredux catalysis nowadays. They inhibit uh, this formation uh, of, of separated charges and instead they do energy transfer, which is deteriorating for the process. So with that, uh, I will leave you um, just to resume a little bit of what I've talked about. First, I talked about these single molecule electronics um, where we can really use this as a platform for uh, studying uh, various things such as the oxidation state of molecules and their, uh, their properties such as uh, vibrational uh, excited, excited states. Um, and later I talked about metallophotoredux catalysis to make um, interesting natural products which can have a promise for a pharmaceutical industry. But we identified the challenge, which is this process here where we need to have a base or very high quantities of a base to actually get productive catalysis going, whereas otherwise the quantum yield of the reaction is just too low to be practically uh, relevant. So with that, I will thank the people uh, who helped me uh, in these projects, uh, the PhD students, uh, Sijing and Alex, uh, working on the metallophotoredux catalysis part, and Jakob and James uh, in Oxford, uh, working on the single molecule electronics and the, the physics of those things. Um, of course, all the funding I also thank. And I want to mention that if anyone is interested or knows any master student looking for PhD positions that I will have fully funded positions coming up shortly. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bart, for this very nice presentation. We have time for some questions. Thank you very much for these nice words. But my question is on your first part. Yeah. Are we concluding that um, 
you see no way to really make these uh, molecule transistors uh, some point in the future that they are going to be really competitive. So I got this impression that you say that's it. Um, um, in the near future, no, especially not with these graphene kind of junctions. Uh, oh. There are several other options uh, to use. Of course, you can just use gold. That's much more reproducible. And in that way, you can, you can really reproducibly bind molecules there. But with graphene, the problem is really this, this electro burning procedure doesn't leave you with a very homogeneous size and you don't know how the edges of the graphene, what they look like. They could be just OHs, they could be ketones, they could be whatever, and we don't know. There's no way of knowing. And then to bind the molecule there reproducibly is uh, too big of a challenge for the moment here. Hi, thank you for the very nice talk. I was actually also wondering about these edges of this uh, graphene. You said that you don't know what they look like, but you know more or less what they're made of. Are they like hydrogenated or are they just reconstructed? And and in also in relation to this, you said that the molecule gets oxidized, but what what gets reduced instead? Or where does the like, or, or did, no? Yeah, um, so the edges, Again, we're doing the electro burning in air usually. Um, so in air, we assume that they are all terminated in hydroxyls or ketones or uh, carboxylic acids. We can also do the uh, electro burning procedure in hydrogen, which we've tried. Um, you need higher voltages, which shows that it is a different process that is occurring. So we're not burning the graphene away in that case. And it's probably hydrogenated then. But there's also still just oxygen from the substrate below it. So we're, we're doing this on, on silica, right? So it might just steal some oxygen from that as well. That's completely possible. Um, we've also done it in just in vacuum. It gives more or less the same results as in hydrogen, which leads us to believe that the hydrogen is not actually doing anything there. Um, to answer your second question, what is being reduced? Your guess is as good as mine, but seeing how we're talking about a single molecule, I'm pretty sure that the electron could just sit somewhere on the graphene far away from it, and it won't really cause any electrostatic effects. Yeah. OK. Any further question? If not, we can thank Bart and all the speakers of this session. <laughs> Okay, we will start tomorrow at uh, half past nine. Okay, we will follow with the presentations of the people of the institute. And now we have the, the meeting with the external committee. <laughs>